Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're taking a, a really necessary look at endometriosis. It's this chronic gynecological condition, affects roughly one in 10 women and girls of reproductive age globally. That's that's huge, about 190 million people. Our mission today is to kind of unpack why it's so often missed and what makes it such a complex, um, debilitating inflammatory disorder. It's way more than just tissue in the wrong place. Absolutely. And it's crucial to grasp the sheer scale of the burden here. Uh -huh. Globally, this condition is a major contributor to disability adjusted life years, dailies, you know, yeah. mostly because of the severe chronic pelvic pain and the infertility issues that often come with it. Okay, so let's try and unpack that complexity. Pathologically, the definition is finding tissue like the endometrium, the uterine lining, but outside the uterus. And the key point, right, is that this ectopic tissue is hormonally active. It responds to the menstrual cycle. Exactly, which means it causes this localized cyclical bleeding, whatever it is, and inflammation, scarring. And while we usually think, okay, it's in the pelvis, ovaries, ligaments, that sort of thing. Right, that's the common understanding. The anatomy can be really surprising. There are documented cases, um, way outside the pelvis. Oh, definitely. We're talking lungs, the pleura, the pericardium around the heart, even the central nervous system, really distant locations. Which brings us to the cause, the etiology. It yeah. gets pretty interesting here. Samson's theory, retrograde menstruation, where flow goes backwards, that's been dominant for ages. That's the classic explanation, yeah. But it just can't explain those lung cases, or right. brain cases. Exactly. Like, it falls short. So you need other theories. Things like... Uh, vascular or lymphatic metastasis, basically, yeah. tissue spreading through blood or lymph, mm. and colomic metaplasia, too. And what's fascinating, really, is that this this heterogeneity, all these different potential causes, maybe polygenic factors plus environment. Mm -hmm. Multifactorial. That's precisely why it's such a challenge, isn't it? Why there isn't one single cure. That's now. the core of the treatment difficulty, yes. Now, the symptoms, they can be horrific. Really severe period pain dysmenorrhea, chronic pelvic pain, pain during sex dyspareunia. Yet, despite how, well, crippling this can be, the average time to get a diagnosis is, it's staggering. Up to 11 years from when symptoms first start. 11 years. It's a clinical catastrophe, frankly. Mm -hmm. And historically, that delay was baked in. You had to have surgery, a laparoscopy to confirm it. That was the so-called gold standard. Right, surgical confirmation. And you combine that requirement with this broader societal tendency to, you know, normalize or dismiss severe gynecological pain. Yeah, it's just, just a bad period. Exactly. You created this huge barrier to getting timely care. But things are finally shifting, thankfully. There's a modern paradigm shift. Mm. Newer guidelines are saying, look, let's move towards a non-surgical clinical diagnosis first. Use advanced imaging like specialized transvaginal ultrasound, TVU, or MRI. Yes. Get the diagnosis suspected. Get treatment started immediately. Don't wait for surgery. To cut down that 11-year wait. Absolutely vital because we now recognize the harm, the morbidity caused by that decade plus delay far outweighs the benefit of just getting immediate surgical proof. And we also know the old surgical staging system, the RESRM score, it doesn't actually correlate that well. The amount of disease seen doesn't always match the patient's pain level. So moving on to management, as you said, current treatments aren't cures. They aim for symptom control. Things like NSAIs, anti-inflammatories, hormonal suppression. Standard first-line approaches. And for more severe cases, there are advanced agents, GNRH analogs. Right. These basically induce a temporary reversible medical menopause. They shut down the cycle, suppress estrogen. Correct. But, and this is a severe catch, that low estrogen, the hypoestrogenism, carries a real risk of irreversible bone loss. Ah, okay. So what do you do about that? You must use what's called ADBAC therapy at the same time usually a low dose of progestin or sometimes a bisphosphonate to protect the bones. It's critical. Wow. Okay. And beyond the physical, the psychosocial toll is immense. We see profoundly impaired health-related quality of life. And the comorbidity with mental health issues is just huge. The numbers are stark. Prevalence rates for anxiety can range wildly, up to maybe 87.5% in some studies. Depression, similarly high, sometimes cited up near 98.5%. That's incredibly high. It really is. And it creates this vicious negative cycle. Chronic physical pain drives mental health deterioration, which underscores why integrated care treating the mind and body together is so essential for these patients. 
We have clear evidence now that quality of life correlates much more strongly with anxiety and depression levels than it does with, say, the anatomical stage of the disease found at surgery. So wrapping this up, what does this all mean for you, the listener? We've covered quite a bit the complexity, the diagnostic nightmare, the treatment challenges, the mental health impact. It's a major global health challenge. So here's a final thought to leave you with. Considering that this huge diagnostic delay is partly driven by society normalizing women's pain, and that the most effective drugs, the GnRH analogs, often force patients who might want to conceive to choose between pain relief and fertility. How fundamentally do we need to change our entire approach to validating, believing, and truly addressing women's reproductive health experiences across the board?